Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for joining us on uh, this week's um, SAI NanoChat seminar. Really excited to have uh, Mo, as I call him, Mo Mustajo Radi. Um, he will be talking today about a recent paper they published on effective participatory science education in a diverse Latin American population. Uh, quick background, he finished his PhD at Harvard and uh, now is a postdoc um, at UCSF. And if that's not, uh, uh, if one is not doing that, is busy um, getting involved in science outreach with Cuba de Ciencia, Bolivia. And I'm really excited to hear an update, to hear what he's been doing, to hear about this uh, data set that he has collected here and have a conversation um, really about uh, metrics and how do you measure science outreach. So uh, Mo, welcome to the SI uh, NanoChat seminar and look forward to chatting with you over the next uh, hour or so. Thank you, Fanyal. Thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. No, uh, it's been a really a pleasure. I've been working with Fanyal for several years now. So he has definitely seen me grow and I've seen him grow as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm to finally be invited. <laughs> <laughs> Excited to have you. Yay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, as my final mention, we recently, uh, okay, now this is not working. Okay. okay. Um, we recently published a, a paper called Effective Participatory Science Education in a Diverse Latin American Population. If this is not your interest, you're in the wrong chat. Uh, <laughs> now's the time to turn off YouTube, uh, but, <laughs> but stay, uh, stay, 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 it'll, it'll be good, stay. <laughs> yeah, no, it will be good, it will be good. Um, so it would, you know, it's been a significant amount of work, especially done by uh, Leonardo Ferreira and Giovanni Carrasso, who really led this, uh, uh, the data analysis part of this paper. So it's been a pretty interesting, pretty exciting to work with them as well on this. So. I want to give my uh, my acknowledgments before I even start a talk. Uh, <laughs> Always good. But so, you know, some of the important points of this talk is that uh, it's in the population of we, in which we are actually studying. So we uh, focus in Bolivia. Uh, for those who don't know, Bolivia it's right in the middle of South America, um, which actually has some advantages. Uh, one of them is actually has a very great diversity of uh, of climates and of people in general. So you can you have on the west the Andes, uh, the salt deserts, and in the east you have basically the Amazon. So in a relatively small territory, we're talking about uh, ten million square kilometers, um, you have thirty six uh, recognized nations. Uh, those are the native populations, which make actually about seventy percent of the country's population. So it's a very small territory uh, with just a high diversity of people in general, it's a diversity of languages, so 36 languages. Uh, just to put it in comparison, this is uh, the country with the most languages and it's equal to um, India. So these are the two countries with the most languages <laughs> in a place. So uh, small territory, uh, a lot of uh, diversity of the population. So we actually thought that this place was particularly interesting to measure some of the impacts of uh, uh, our approach to, to teaching science in general. Um, so another interesting point about Bolivia, it's that the country has had a very stable government for the last, um, since 2005, 14 years. Uh, so it's been the same president, same team. Uh, and they had, it has been a team that has really invested a lot in education, I have to say. Uh, right now, uh, Bolivia, as a percentage of GDP, is the second country in Latin America after Cuba that invests the highest proportion of its money towards education. Uh, so it invests about 8.3% of its GDP towards education. To put it in perspective, uh, the US, the UK, and uh, all the you know countries that are in the research forefront uh, invest between five and six percent of their GDP. So that they're doing particularly good. Uh, however, it has not given uh, the results they expect that Bolivia keeps placing consistently last in every measurement when it comes to innovation, entrepreneurship, or education in Latin America. Um, so 
there is a seems to be a big disconnect into the efforts that are being put versus um, the uh, the results that they're getting out of it. And I I think and my team thinks that a lot of it has to do with the way the resources are being spent and the way um, the um, policies are made in order for us to really develop a, a scientific program there, uh, our science education program particularly. So this is really what we were uh, dealing with when we started the project. Uh, and I have to say, we started this project in 2015 uh, with the very first edition of, of Clube, Clube de Ciencia, and I'll explain a little bit more of what Clube actually is uh, in a second. But, uh, you know, this is uh, the results is basically three years later. Uh, and uh, I'll go a little bit more into the details of our history as a foundation and what we actually do. Um, but before we even like touch the population, we wanted to really try to understand them a little bit better. And in order to do so, we uh, created an online survey. And this was really given in the context of, it, it was targeted towards students who were towards the end of high school, beginning of college, meaning last two years of high school, first three years of college. Their college is five to six years. So just to put you in perspective, it's half of uh, basically the first half. Uh, and we wanted to ask them, uh, you know, this was in the context of applying to one of our programs. So this is how we got the people to actually answer the questions. <laughs> and uh, one of the interesting things about Bolivia, and this is also true in Africa, is that uh, they, it has a high cell phone penetrance and high, you know, like most people, like a lot of people have uh, some kind of internet access via cell phone. So we, we thought that the, the um, reaching them out via online was actually feasible. Uh, but we also partnered with several different organizations to be able to reach as many students as possible. So one of the things we did is we reached out to the local media, for instance, we helped them. And we actually got ads from all of the, from most of the newspapers there, including the top three ones. Uh, so we also recruited people that way. We also visit schools, we visit universities. Uh, we, our Facebook page reaches about 50% of the people in our age bracket weekly uh, in Bolivia. So we actually had like a massive way to, 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 to get people to answer this survey and about 900 people answered. Uh, <laughs> 903 if I'm correct. But we asked them, first of all, one very easy question, which is how do you think your education is? Uh, and uh, it was very surprising to us that there was this idea that their education is actually pretty good. Uh, they were pretty satisfied with the way uh, they were being educated. Um, so independently, you know, people that live in private schools uh, institutions rate their education a little bit higher than public ones. No real surprises there, but in general, basically, consistently we got a score of eight out of ten that they thought that that was their education level. Which again, it goes really against what the data actually shows that we, we still rank Bolivia as the country at the very bottom on entrepreneurship and education. So I don't know why this keeps jumping. <laughs> uh, um, when it comes to uh, science, particularly. So uh, well, you, you don't have a sense of why, why that is? Is it, is it just overinflation where they're thinking they're better than they actually are? Um, yeah, you know, like we, we call it like, a, like the common dilution. Right. But, uh, it's unclear to us. You know, we actually asked them to explain to us why they think that's the case. And they think the, the thing that the students have this in, have a hard time disentangling, I think, is what the effort they see from their teachers versus what the material that they're being taught are. So, you know, if you ask the students, why do you think your education is good? They will tell you, because my teachers put a lot of effort. Because, you know, uh, despite limitations in infrastructure, we still have dedication. And you, you get this kind of answers. So that seems to be driving a lot of their perception of education, it seems to be more the actual relationship with the teachers and with their classmates. Right, and then, because you know, when they do the PISA tests and so forth, right, um, uh, as you mentioned, probably Bolivia, you said ranking close to the bottom or something, right? Um, um, I wonder, here, they're measuring their own self-efficacy, right? 
uh, in terms of what they think. But when you actually put the rubber to the road and get them to actually you know, test them out, right? Let, let's test, make sure you actually know what you're talking about, then things may change. And this brings up the point about assumptions, right? Um, right. Because you guys went in with some assumptions, right? Right. You went and in I with wonder, assumptions. yeah. And I wonder how these were, were those assumptions basically challenged with this data? Like, <laughs> we never push it to them back. You know, Bolivia, I'll have to say uh, something I forgot to mention. It's Bolivia as a country has a very strong national identity and they really are reluctant to a lot of things that are foreign, including the PISA test. You know, the government official position on the, on the PISA test is that this is an imposition from developed countries oh. who basically want to pat themselves in the back. So they refuse to take the test. <laughs> um, okay. You know, and, and this, is, uh, this is something very important, uh, actually, because we started to see some effects of, of our program, and I'm going to go to, I mentioned them at the end of the talk, mm -hmm. that were way, uh, way unexpected. <laughs> and I had to, you know, like, especially when it comes to the governmental level and, and these kind of meetings, which, again, we just weren't even thinking about it when we started this, uh, how the government was going to react to the results and how the government was going to react to all of a sudden you have a bunch of uh, people from abroad, a lot of them Americans coming to Bolivia and, uh, and teaching what they think is their vision for science. And, you know, to give a historical perspective, Bolivia and the United States lack diplomatic relationships. Uh, we don't, we have embassies in each other's countries, uh, but we don't have ambassadors. We have charge affairs, basically, which Basically, to put it in perspective, our relationships are better than Iran, uh, but they're worse so than Cuba, right? Cuba mm -hmm. and the U.S. do have embassies. Uh, so they have ambassadors, right? So there is a lot of reluctancy. And, and, and basically, in 2008 was when the ambassadors of each of countries were expelled. And this was over a debate on national sovereignty, specifically. So, so you can see where we're coming from. I see, I see. <laughs> it was a very <laughs> difficult... Uh, scenario to begin with and and i think at the very beginning we were even personally attacked by the president <laughs> so, oh, wow. you know, it, it was uh it was an interesting uh, panorama definitely when we were uh, getting into this topic so you know there's no we don't take as so bolivia doesn't take the pisa test but we do have this kind of um you know latin american uh science competitions and science olympians where we consistently rank last there is the War Innovation Index, which does include all countries, regardless of whether they want to be included or not. Uh, and, you know, that's where you start to see where we compare, how we compare to. I see. And, and to be um, you factual about this, of the Latin American countries that do take the PISA test, out of the, there are 65 countries in the world that, last time I checked, that take this, the, the PISA test. All of the Latin American countries that take the test at best score, I think 53 is the highest, which is Chile. So, you know, we're still dealing with a very similar scenario than our neighbors. And I'll say, you know, uh, Peru, if I'm not mistaken, scores last of Latin America. And I wouldn't think that Bolivian education is any better, if not worse than Peruvian, for instance. I see. So, so yeah, we, we kept seeing this kind of uh, I, idea that their, their education was pretty good. Something that we noticed was uh, we also start asking them how do you think do you, do you think you have the tools or do you think you you have what it takes to be successful in your environment in science? And it was pretty interesting that most of the students were pretty confident that they could succeed in science. And and this is again in sharp contrast with what the data actually shows you that Bolivia has no PhD programs, for instance. It only has one master's program in science in, uh, across, uh, you know, for 10 million people. Uh, so there is really not, you know, this Western definition of success in science is not really, uh, there's no tools to do so. Uh, yet they seem to be pretty confident that they had everything around them to be uh, successful in the science. Uh, and again, this is true for kids who are in high school, who get kids who are in college, both private and public institutions. If you actually consider the scores that these kids have in high school uh, or in the previous science courses, no surprises here. You know, people who achieve 
higher grades in science classes tend to be more confident that they can succeed in science. Uh, <laughs> uh, here it was also a pretty interesting male students tended to be more confident that they could succeed in science than females. So this idea is also uh, translated there as well. <laughs> it's not only a developer idea that uh, male are more confident in general. But again, when we talk about perception of education and we try to correlate it with confidence, we really see no, we saw no correlation really. So you could be pretty confident and think that you had a pretty bad education quality, or you could be perceived that your education quality was outstanding. And you basically, we, we saw no difference of whether that affected the confidence of how the students uh, will perform in the sciences. Just pretty interesting on its own, I think. <laughs> but, um, and to be fair, I, uh, this is, uh, uh, we, we, this is just overall perception of quality of education, but we also have the statistics when we call and ask them by sub by subject in uh in the sciences and they, they kind of score this and they basically score the same. So we really see no correlation there. So the way we actually work in Bolivia is we design these courses, these are week-long courses, they're 40 hours uh over five days and they are taught with two components one's a uh, theoretical component and one is a practical component or meaning a lab work uh and we really want to do a participatory participatory approach and really act, you know in, implement as much active learning as possible these are taught by two people each course has two instructors one is someone coming from a developed country um, who is either a PhD student or a postdoc uh, or a PI in the US, in Europe, and it's uh, paired in, uh, with a local faculty or a local uh, investigator. So we try to pair them based on interest and we ask them that together they should develop the course. This has several objectives. One of them is to really start creating those bridges of collaboration later on between uh, the people who come and the people who go away to bring the expertise from the developed world uh, into Bolivia, but also to have the local instructor almost translate that to the national reality. <laughs> uh, so we think that this two instructor component is actually a pretty important point. And you know, the instructors tend to be pretty young. Um, so they serve kind of a, as a way to like be direct mentors with the students. The students can really completely relate to the instructors in many aspects. So usually in the mornings, we have more of a theoretical component where, uh, oh, and I have to say, these courses are not like calculus one or anything like that. They're actually based around a project uh, in which uh, has to be around the expertise of, of the investigators, basically. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Leo here on the left, who is also the first author of the paper, he, his expertise is genome engineering. So he designed in a course that it is at the end of the day, basics of molecular biology, uh, but it's done in the context of uh, genome engineering and CRISPR. So the students learn, you know, things from what is a restriction enzyme to more details of how CRISPR works. Uh, later in the lab, they actually do perform a CRISPR experiment, very simple, uh, from pre-done kits that we can just purchase through either Carolina Scientific, the audience, back your brains, uh, whatever uh, your favorite outreach supplier is. Uh, <laughs> but we try to keep them on a very low budget, uh, just teach the concept. So, you know, just to give an example, in that particular course, they use uh, a kit from the audience to do genome engineering in yeast where they change the color of a yeast from one color to another one. Uh, and that also inspires to think a little bit bigger. We, we are trying to push the idea of entrepreneurship a little bit uh more recently so for instance leo makes them try to design you know new answers that could be answered using crispr technology so a lot of them because they come from a farming background they think about you know genome engineering cows for instance to increase the milk production and things like that so that's kind of the the full cycle of how the clueless courses work these are some of the courses with the, some of the pictures of the theoretical component the lab components again we don't have any fancy lab in fact we actually borrow space from a university that doesn't have a biology uh, department or any biology course 
whatsoever. So we actually have to bring all the equipment on all the reagents ourselves, <laughs> which, uh, you know, uh, a lot of institutions, including Harvard and UCSF, have been pretty generous at helping us with that aspect. But, uh, but you can really see that we do this at like a very low budget, really, uh, or as low as we can possibly do it. Um, and no, this is over a week, right? This is over a week. So, you know, the instructors have this challenge of making their course entertaining. And if you really think about it, 40 hours, it's not in, in a week. It's actually, you know, pretty equivalent to having two hours uh, a week for a whole semester, right? Three hours a week for a whole semester. So, in fact, when you compare the curricula of our courses, and I'll come on, I'm going to come to that point in a little bit. Uh, they, they really do resemble courses that are taught there in general. Uh, uh, whenever there is an overlap, and I, I'm gonna stuck specifically in microbiology, which is the one course where there is actually a almost complete overlap. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they kind of like they're that pushed to think a little bit further and try to apply what they learn into like ideas. So at the end of the of the week, we have this fair where they present their ideas. So it really varies by instructor. Some of them make them do prototypes. Some of them make them do almost like Shark Tank kind of ideas of like, this is what I want to do. Or some of them just make them focus on like one particular disease and think about solutions that they could propose. Uh, so that's kind of the, the structure of how the fair works. And the fair one will last like three hours. And uh, the students are pretty excited about it in general. So to give you an idea, so what we did is out of the 900 people who responded, we selected 109 uh, and we put them through biology courses. I have to say as Clubus, uh, Clubus de Ciencia, we work on uh, several areas of science, not only biology. For the purpose of this paper, we focus on biology, but we have results on engineering, physics, chemistry, uh, and entrepreneurship and business in general as well. Um, but for the purpose of this, this paper, because of the high number of, of uh, students, uh, we focus on, on biology. Um, so on the left, you see, so you have here two maps of Bolivia. Uh, on the right is the actual population distribution of Bolivia. And on the left is the distribution of the, pop, of the student population that we had in Clubus. So we try to the best of our abilities to match <laughs> these two maps. Uh, you know, it wasn't always the case. You, you have Pando, for instance, in the north, where there is a 1% of the country's population, but there was not a single applicant from Pando. So, you know, you, you do what you can do. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we try to have similar numbers of male and female students, kind of relate the age of the students, which between the bracket of what we work with, which is usually 15 to 22 uh varying a little bit by state because some states people graduate are younger some people graduate uh a little bit older um education level you know we have kids from high school kids from college uh and then we also as kind of an internal control we had some students who have been through clubes before through our program uh in a different topic but those were basically 32 students and then the rest were students who were coming to Clubus for the first time, which are truly the more experimental <laughs> group in a sense. Uh, and, you know, we ask, so we focus on six different subjects between biology and these range from neuroscience to genome engineering to more simple biology, meaning, you know, principles of microscopy, principles of, of microbiology. Uh, and we, we had these six courses uh, and we asked each of pair of instructors to design five questions which they thought would be kind of the nail in the coffin that we thought would really be the most important part of their course. Like my students should be able to know this uh, by the end of the course. So, okay, so this jumped, I don't know why. Uh, so, and we tested the students with the exact same questions without them knowing they were going to be tested at the end of the course on the exact same questions uh, before and after uh, going through our program. So, 
you can see basically either and then in on the left here on a it's basically all courses combined as well as basically b through g which is each course independently the students kind of more or less perform the same before and and uh, they, they end up with like a 2.5 on average fold increase in knowledge on these particular topics uh, by the end of the week. Well, no surprises there if you think about it. Well, you're going through a course, of course, you're learning something. We, you know, that's uh, right, no, that's right, no. So, <laughs> you know, uh, so when we, uh, I, you know, I give you a little bit of kind of the author's perspective on this. That was kind of the, you know, in like the, of course, we're going we're gonna to get a result. But when we sat down and actually sit, started thinking about some of these students, a lot of these students, I'll say that, especially the college students, they were already in biology related degrees. So I was very surprised that they didn't actually know <laughs> a lot of the concepts that we taught the show now. Uh, they, they, uh, um, so we found a course in Bolivia, uh, which became a very interesting course because their curriculum, our curriculum was very similar. Uh, it was not taught using our approach. It was just more of a theoretical course with a lab component, just like a regular microbiology course in any university. And, but again, curricular wise, we're pretty, pretty similar. Uh, and what was interesting is we had some students from Clubes who had been in Clubus before in a topic different from microbiology who were actually in that course as well. So we pair with our, the professor in that course and we ask them, can we test your students after taking your microbiology course and see how they perform on this same exact five question. Mm -hmm. So in this, we are actually asking about two questions, right? We're talking about do our courses do better than university level courses and also the, we have a bias on the selection of the students, meaning maybe we just have very good students uh, in general that they just perform better. Uh, so this is what we saw. So basically, we didn't see any statistical difference between the people, the students who had literally just finished the microbiology course and the students that, uh, who performed in Clubus before taking our course meaning there was really no difference between taking or not the microbiology course. And we also saw no difference of the clueless students that were between this group, meaning it's really not the selection of students, but it actually seems to be the approach, which is what gained, what we're talking about, pushes, pushed them to gain the knowledge. So, so Mo, you had given them the same test, right? That, right. That you've given them, okay. okay. Yeah, it was the exact same test right after they finished the semester, basically. Can you give me a sense of the numbers, um, the, the gray and the purple, like uh, population okay, of so students? For this particular course, we had about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 20 and 20. Okay. okay. 20 that were through Clubus and 20 who were not. The university microbiology students who have been in Clubus in a different group are only two. Uh, oh, okay. Put that disclaimer. Okay. Uh, and it's the variability, right? It's pretty high there. Um, um, so is in purple, you're saying there are two in purple? No, no, uh, in green. So in green, sorry. university okay. microbiology course. Plus who, CDEC, okay. Who had been a Clubus in Clubus that were different from microbiology. Okay, okay. In purple are just overall university students. Okay. Who were in microbiology except those two students. Those mm -hmm. two students were not included in that statistics. Even, I'll have to say, the, the statistics did not change whether we include the students or not. Okay. Uh, but for the purpose of the paper, we, we removed them so that we can put them in their own category. Um, so that was very interesting when we saw this result, I, I'll have to say. And uh, it was actually, I think, the most inspiring set of data that we, that we found in the, in the paper in general, at least. Yeah, because this, this speaks to this approach, right? Your, your unique approach saying, let's do a project based learning right right and and right. and you know these experiences to students and see how they perform so right yeah. and it also speaks a little bit more on the idea and i think it's also important we, we when we were doing the literature review in order to propose the paper and to start writing a paper and later when we're reviewing the paper um it's really hard to find literature there that actually tests 
education in the developing world. Uh, when we talk about project based and you know modern approaches to education in general, uh, a lot of these papers come from the assumption that minority populations in the developed world are really representative of the developing world, which actually doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, so, you know, I think it also made us re-ask the question, I mean, you know, is it time to revisit a lot of these assumptions <laughs> in general? So one of the assumptions of, um, you know, if you read the participatory science uh, approach, uh, uh, literature it tells you that in general, you know, this project-based approach turns to favor students who are underperformers over people who are overperformers because overperformers, especially if they have not been used to this uh, methodology, tend to kind of be reluctant to it, right? They, it's very new, they, they don't know how they react to it. They, they kind of tend to abandon the courses or tend to underperform in relation to other courses. And, um, you know, anecdotally can tell you most of our students are, are pretty well uh, when it comes to performance. I mean, I showed you the data before. Um, yet all of them came to every single like class and on, you know, with exception of one, all of them increased their grades. So I think uh, that speaks for not being a complete agreement with the literature here in the developed world. You know, we, we tried to break it. Uh, so one of the things that people kept asking us was, you know, can you, can you tell us something about the students? Is there like a difference between, you know, rich students, poor students, uh, younger students? Why, why, you know, like are college students doing better and just driving your statistics? So we tried to, to do this, uh, to <laughs> literally sit back at the data and see, okay, what are all the possible cost funding factors that we can think of uh, that could have affected our data? So we really see no difference before or after the test in male and female students. We see uh, no major difference. We mostly see no statistical difference, sorry, between the students who are teenagers, meaning who are in high school, versus college students. Uh, uh, actually, we do see a slight difference, uh, increase in college versus pre-college, but that's to be expected, especially if these kids are biology majors uh, in general. Uh, you know, public institutions tend to do slightly better than private institutions. Uh, that is true when you look at the rankings of university in Bolivia. The public universities tend to be better than the, public, the private ones. Um, we really saw no difference between students who were coming to our program for the first time versus returning, uh, which we thought was pretty interesting in general. And we also broke them by the depart department or is very equivalent to what in the United States called states. And uh, Santa Cruz, which is where we run the program, is the richest, wealthiest department by far from the other uh, departments. But we also saw no, no statistical difference uh, for how the students perform from Santa Cruz versus elsewhere. Uh, something that we saw drove uh, the results down with whether the students were working after class versus not. Uh, I have to say a lot of the students that we have come from a very low socioeconomic background, meaning a lot of them are like miners or farmers. And these are the students who do tend to perform. Uh, uh, if they have worked, they tend to perform poorly. And you know, not poorly, but worse than the non-working ones. Uh, and this is actually interesting because Bolivia recently passed a law in which they actually lowered the, work, the legal working age uh, to 12 years. So, it actually speaks a lot about uh, how we can actually, you know, balance this with the goals of the of the government, which is actually improving education. Right. So, so it's a little bit of a discussion we all have with the government uh, behind closed doors as well. And well, that makes sense, right? In G, that if you're working, you have less time to right. Like you know, yeah, um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, true especially if your job is not related to your major right <laughs> yeah yeah and, and the stress is there and, and so forth right um right yeah. um and again we really saw no difference for instance on um, people who are their parents or they had some kind of exposure to stem prof uh, professionals uh or whether they were confident already uh, that they were going to perform well in the course or not 
Um, something I didn't mention before is, as I, I mean, I mentioned that we have different subjects uh, within Clubes, but when the students apply to, to Clubes, they can select courses that they think they're interested. We purposely randomized some students in each course, and we, we told the instructors there were students who were randomized, but we didn't tell them who they were or how many there were. Uh, so that means these were students who have selected to be in different subjects that were not biology, and we pushed them into a biology course. And we wanted to un really understand is, is really interest in the course what's driving uh, performance. Um, you know, like if, if this is all of a sudden your dream subject, uh, <laughs> and you have someone who's coming from Harvard and it's, you know, taking a whole week to teach you, is it really just that interest that is driving the results? Uh, versus, you know, someone who is your teacher or your professor at the university, you might see at the supermarket later that day. Uh, so we randomized uh, the students, and I can tell you some, some courses had as little as two or three students who were randomized. One of the courses, two thirds of the students were randomized into the course. Uh, so we really want, you know, to, so, and this was done on purpose, that whole gradient of randomization, so that we can actually see is it the interest in the course or is it just uh, something else? And we really saw no difference, uh, which means whether the students were interested on the course or not, they still perform similarly before in the pretest and also after in the post-test, uh, which really speaks, I think, for the, for the methodology to either bring in the interest or sharing the knowledge in general. And, you know, as a final point, we kind of asked the students whether we, they thought that these courses and this approach really excites them and makes them want to uh, perform better in the sciences uh, or even follow a scientific career to begin with. And we, we, we see that, you know, the large majority of them get pretty excited about science. And th this is true, like we, we, we do have a community of them. Uh, which they have basically an alumni association at this point, which works in eight out of nine departments in Bolivia. So they meet regularly. So I think we have really made an impact longer term. Um, so to talk a little bit, maybe I, I, I shift a little bit of gears. I can talk a little bit about the effects that we have had uh, as an organization and really which started purely as a just doing outreach and now has moved a little bit more towards policy <laughs> development. Uh, but it's kind of being a situation in which we kind of were forced to. Uh, I'll have to say, you know, like it, we, it wasn't part of the plan. Uh, but sometimes you, you have to take the, the lead where the lead is needed, I think. Um, so as I mentioned before, we, Bolivia and the United States lack ambassadors. We have embassies, we don't have ambassadors. We have charge the affairs, which for all intended purposes are business directors in each embassy. Um, and this has been going on in Bolivia for 11 years now. So in 2008, there was a big uh, debate and this has to do a lot with the coca leaf. So the coca leaf, it's, uh, you know, the precursor for cocaine, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a leaf that has been part of Bolivian culture and tradition for millennia. Right, like uh, it is completely legal in, in Bolivia to use the coca, in peak coca is used for medic, um, medical purposes, it's used for uh, nutrition as well. But of course, uh, the DEA and you know, the, the United States government in general just uh, has this eye on, on, the, uh, on the coca leaf uh, in particular, right? Because uh, it affects them as well. So in 2008, there was this big dilemma, which led to both ambassadors being uh, expelled, both from the United States and from Bolivia. Uh, in 2015, we started Club as a Ciencia as a foundation with a lot of collaboration with the press. Uh, but more importantly, I think our seed funding, 100% of it came from the US Department of State. We actually wrote the grant as a public diplomacy uh grant it was not an education grant it was it was a way to really try to start building these bridges between uh uh bolivia and the united states through education uh so in 2016 we had our first edition of clubes almost immediately after uh the bolivian government basically summed up for the first time uh 
officially all Bolivian scientists who were living abroad, uh, doing PhDs, doing postdocs, uh, and brought them uh, to meet with the whole cabinet and the whole, I uh, went with the president itself. Uh, so that was like a big shift of gears in the Bolivian government. It was completely unexpected. Uh, so we were there as well, and we kind of led a lot of the uh, commissions that happened during the program, during that summit, and also afterwards. And we still continue to collaborate with the governments. Um, one of the things that was born again in a country that has a lot of national identity uh, was this idea of launching graduate fellowships uh, for students to go abroad, to go to the United States, to go to Europe, uh, and this was born almost immediately at the, uh, at the summit uh, and in the, in the panel that was led by us. Um, in 2017, Kluges moved from being a purely out, you know, science outreach to also having some other events. Uh, so we hosted the biggest hackathon in the country, uh, which was also a collaboration this time with the UK. Uh, which was pretty interesting because it also got us a lot of press, but also got us again the contact of the Bolivian government. But this time, the Bolivian government in the United States, meaning the Bolivian embassy, who actually asked us whether we could host an event at the embassy. Uh, so we had in 2018, Clubes de Ciencia Bolivia that was made for Bolivian immigrants in the United States. Um, and it was hosted at inside the headquarters of the embassy itself, which I thought was a pretty special thing. Uh, and um, so it was the first edition of Clubes in DC. I'll have to mention DC is the home of the large majority of Bolivian expats uh, in the United States. So it's about three to 400,000 Bolivians live there. So, or, you know, the DC metro area. Uh, Later that year, we were contacted by the office of the vice president. Uh, and we met with the vice president behind closed doors, with the president of the Senate as well, uh, and start drafting some things which will uh, eventually come into effect. Uh, so the first thing is a startup law to really start culturing the idea of tech development in Bolivia. And we proposed the movement of the uh, currently, Bolivia has an vice, it had a vice ministry of uh, science and technology that was under the supervision of the Ministry of Education that could move to the Ministry of Planification. And they launched their very first grants that were given for scientists and also for exchanges. Uh, and as of last week, we co hosted an event together with the American Embassy and the Bolivian government. Uh, in Bolivia. And something that was announced as of a month ago, but it's been over a year of work of my team, uh, is being the creation of the new Ministry of Science and Technology, which will be completely independent uh, from any of the other ministries, but it's, the point is to support um, the other ministries uh, as well. Uh, so now we are working on the infrastructure of how this ministry is actually gonna work. Uh, and the idea is to launch it uh, by 2020. Uh, so it has been announced, but you know we're still working on the logistics of it. Uh, we're working also on an innovation district uh, in Santa Cruz. And you know my long-term dream is to also have uh, this kind of technology of, uh, offices around our embassies. Uh, so we think you know we started kind of. We, we think there are really three pillars to education in the developing world that has to be kind of online communication, bringing researchers to the ground, but also taking researchers abroad and bringing them back to Bolivia. So we're working a little bit closer on the development of these three pillars uh, over the next few years. Uh, and, be, you know, I, I want to be tremendously thankful to the people who have made this possible and also the government who have made this possible, I think. The U.S. government has been extremely valuable to us, but now, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, the Bolivian government has also uh, helped us out quite a bit. Um, we we recently got the largest grant that has ever been given by the Bolivian government to any nonprofit, which has been pretty 
nice. Um, yeah, congrats, uh, that's great. <laughs> thanks. Uh, so we're growing. Uh, you know, uh, and I also want to take the opportunity. You know, this is something that we we are all graduate students, we're all postdocs who kind of are doing this in our free time, and it's becoming a full time job. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, uh, sometimes I tell my boss, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I had to go for an exhibition. I had to meet with a president or, you know, <laughs> this kind of things. But I also want to say, you know, this has been really driven by two people. You know, I have a gigantic team. My team is over 50 people, but two people have really driven the academic part of, uh, Clubes, which is, uh, Leonardo. Uh, I mean, I circled the two of them between the team picture. Leonardo is the one wearing the red shorts. And uh, and Giovanni, who's been more on the diplomatic side uh, of the analysis. And one last slide I want to show. I do want to do a shameless self promotion here and say that we are uh, editing a special edition of uh, Frontiers in Education. That is topics going to be science, education, and public diplomacy. Uh, don't think about it as public diplomacy between countries. It can be between communities. Uh, we're particularly interested in receiving. Uh, opinions on you know the interface between technology and how it's shaping society so we're happy to receive submissions up to february february 2nd if i'm not mistaken is the deadline so please search us up and uh i here's my email and also our contact information if you need to reach cool. out no that was great <laughs> um we can try it. I mean, there's so much to unpack, but I think we're, I believe we have time. We probably can have you back as well at some point because I'm sure people are wondering who will be watching this later uh, to say, hey, how are you doing all this? You know, uh, you mentioned your full time postdoc, you escape here to go meet presidents and so forth. And so <laughs> I think that's, uh, I think kudos to you. Congratulations. And just having, you know, you're publishing papers, you know, I think it's amazing that you're able to do this. and. And I think I'm sure people are wondering, like, so what's, how are you sort of structuring your own development, right? As a scientist, as, a, as an outreach um, professional, right? Almost, <laughs> you know, what's, what's the future for you? you know, how are oh. you envisioning? Yeah. What are you thinking about? Maybe we need to talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a, Just I'm briefly, a, briefly. I'm a, I'm a microbiologist. I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, but I also becoming very passionate with this idea of education, but also more importantly with the idea of science diplomacy. And you know, this interface um, between how countries get along and how does that actually affect the way we collaborate in science? Uh, you know, like I'll give you a classic example. I think what really drove me into this topic was, was the Zika outbreak, right? You have a very defined particular area of the world which is being affected and you have all these other superpowers who are willing to help, but how do you actually do it in a way that you give the right recognition to the right people and, and you build the bridges together? You know, Africa, I think, is at the forefront with this on Ebola, uh, for instance. They have done an amazing job at it, but Latin America has not. Uh, and if you actually look at the contribution of like Latin American scientists to the Zika papers, it's almost negligible when it comes to like birth authorships, for instance. So it's, it's something that is, you know, becoming a lot more interested surprisingly there is very little at the academic side of this so you know we have science diplomats but we have very few of them at the university you know teaching uh and i think it's something that we should start exploring as universities as well to you know start making these kind of uh positions open um i don't think it you know I, the field has existed. It, it, by definition, has always existed as long as scientific collaboration has existed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the actual uh, studying of this has not really uh, been at the priority at the university. So I think it's something I'm really trying to push Makes over sense. the next few years. That's, that's awesome. So I want to ask um, just one quick question. And I think, Juliet, if you have a question, please uh, shoot away as well. Um, I think this approach is good. I did share some links um, for you, Mo. You should check out the Science Corps. We have the founder that joined us very a couple of weeks ago talking about his uh, organization that uh, basically funds a PhD, a recent graduate that goes into, uh, I think for them, they're in two sites, Philippines and India, mm -hmm. and they spend six months there teaching. Um, and I think as you were talking about just the way you're thinking about, you know, measuring impact, 
um, check them out as well because they are also different location entirely, right? Because that's the other Absolutely. question here. As you can imagine, this your product can this be transplanted? Like, if you can you write down the protocol, if you will, right? And someone else, let's say in Botswana, wants to try this out, and could they do it? Right? Could 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 they do it? And so check them out. Science Core. The other place is Dominic Mao. Um, I don't know if you've been in touch with him over here at Harvard. He has the um, program for scientifically inspired leadership program that is in Manipur, India as well. And he also gave a talk recently talking about that approach where he takes some Harvard undergraduates to go on site in Manipur, India. It's a conflict area okay. as well. Something I'll think about like in a conflict zone, how can you do this? Also, Absolutely. Right? <laughs> um, but so I think this is really great. You see all these uh, initiatives like you're in Bolivia and of course, Club de Ciencia in, in several countries in Latin America. Uh, um, and, Spain. And, and, and Spain, wow, and Europe too. So a quick question for you. I wanted to ask about um, the, so slide, if you go to slide number 14, um, that, I think that's a really core important, it sounds like this is very important for you guys, right? In terms of the difference, okay. you know, the after effect. I'm curious for the graph in, in gray or purple, if you were to do the pretest, right? and look at the change, maybe not, maybe I should in purple, so go in purple. If you were to look at the pretests for these students and do the post-test, um, would you, like I would, I would imagine that what you really wanna look for is, is the difference, the change, compare the change versus the absolute like right. um, final result. Would the change be higher, right, in your program than this other? Uh, uh, microbiology because ultimately you're giving them the test that you are testing your students on right right so the, the assumption is they should do better obviously because they're they're going to see the same they don't know they're going to see it again but they are going to see it again right right these other kids have not seen it right am right. i am i right that so right. i wonder how you think about this right yeah. but they have not seen it but they have been tested on the exact same topics because the curriculum okay. were similar right okay they were similar so, right so you know i'm in fact, the, the, the only way we were actually able to get to this group is because the instructor in this microbiology course is actually instructor in Clubus. So see. they even have the same instructor, just a different methodology. Okay. <laughs> so almost, yeah, almost highly controlled, which is really, really cool. Um, but I'll, be, I'll be curious to see that pre, like the pre-post change and compare that. Right, the that's in the microbiology students. Yeah. Right, right, versus the absolute. Uh, so purple, the change in purple versus the uh, orange. Uh, yeah, we, we don't have that data set. Uh, it would yeah. be nice to do it in the future. Uh, yeah, future reference, right? <laughs> and then the last one, uh, quick, quick, quickly, you know, these effects, right? You, you're, you're measuring essentially between T0 or T1, right? If right. you now say, do these changes last, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, could you test them in like two months, three months? Are they going to still be around? Of course, you don't have the data here. Is that something you've thought about? And, you know. Yeah, so it's something that we're going to try to do this next January, which is the next edition, is to try to fish, that, fish back who the students who were in this test were mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and see whether we can retest the exact, the exact same students. Because again, like about 30% of the students tend to return. Uh, a lot of them age out of the program, that's why they don't return. And we also try to limit the number of returns that they have. But, you know, uh, we can't try, we, we obviously won't have all 109, but we might right. have 20 or 30 that we can reach. Like that, that's the goal for January. Right, okay. The to-do list. Okay, uh, Juliet, do you have a question? Oh, so I had, a, you know, more on the education side and the students, did, when they engaged with you, did they feel like motivated to, do what you do or learn what you learn? I mean, what was that engagement like? That was uh, pretty interesting. So at the beginning, uh, the very first day, they're pretty shy in general, I have to say, because they see you as a, someone who is like a lot, of, you know, more educated than them or whatever mm -hmm. their perspective is. Uh, and they're also, they come from a training which, which education is very vertical, right? Like you have the professor, the students do not ask questions, they kind of like are given the answer, right? And all of a sudden you come here and it's like, hey, my name is Mo, you can, no, oh, my name is Mohammed, you can call me Mo, and like, no, I like, I don't know, fishing, whatever. Uh, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden for them, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a culture shock. So the very first day, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit weird. Uh, mm -hmm. But that breaks on really quickly. Uh, and, you know, it's also a little bit interesting because 
you can see that there is students from very diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. You have kids who, again, had to wear a mine the day before, and you have kids who are like actually pretty wealthy in the same classroom. And all of a sudden, you're breaking all these barriers. Right? You're in the same course, you're in the same thing, uh, and you're in the same group. And uh, we can see that complete shift over the week. Uh, so by the fifth day, I think there is absolutely no boundary really between the students and really a lot of trust with the instructors. The point like they all add us on Facebook, they all like follow us throughout, which I think is a pretty cool thing. And we, we tend to maintain a really good relationship with the students. And this is why we keep the course sizes small, meaning under 25, because it is expected from the instructors that go that they will try to help them as much as they can, that they will, uh, you know, write their letters if they want to apply to things and you know they do advise them as well so we have seen a lot of success with this approach i'll say the large majority of our students end up doing something after meaning a fellowship a master's program even a phd program now we have a couple uh and i'll say over 70 percent of them are actually going on to do something really wow. interesting later on uh and this has a lot to do with instructors commitment in general i think uh, but someone was showing me the data the other day from one of the embassies. I can't really disclose which one, but basically of the, of the scholarships that they give out, over 50% of them go to students who have gone through our program. And this is completely independent. Uh, so it seems to be working pretty well. And again, Mo, after one week, right? You, you, you go, your program is one week. Are you doing that anything program afterwards? Is do you keep Again, in touch with have, them? Or? Yeah, yeah. So we keep in touch with them. They have this alumni association, uh, right, which they basically meet pretty regularly. It's called the Ciencia Hoven. Um, and we try to keep in touch with them as much as possible through social network. Again, our Facebook page is pretty influential. Uh, and we try to do these other events throughout the year, these hackathons and whatnot, so that there is a feeling of community. Uh, that's something that is very important to us, that they feel that there is a community and they feel that it is their responsibility that each other is in that community to succeed. Right, right. Because that's the, again, mm -hmm. the one week model. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty short. Yeah, it's surprising. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I have to say it's, it's been pretty particular. I mean, might be also because there was just no other outreach program that was there at this yeah. Yeah. size. So you all of a sudden, you know, it's like you have water in a desert. So it might be, uh, you know, it's, that's probably also part of it, right? Like, where else do they go? Like, if they, they need help getting a master, you know, like, uh, applying to a master's or something, they don't really have another option, so. And, and Mo, for your, I'm just thinking about theory of change, the logic model, what, what is it that you hope, like, the students will, like, what, what do you hope with the Club de Science afterwards? Is, it, is that they go to graduate programs and become scientists, or what is it? Honestly, I have to say, I don't, you know, and, and something we do is we purposely pick people who are not in the sciences as well. And I think just the general appreciation for the scientific method, method and asking for evidence in general. So I don't, don't want particularly the students to go into science careers, but I want them to go to anywhere they were going to go, you know, finance, uh, um, government, whatever. But deep down there, they know that the scientific method is important and they need to ask for data in order to make a decision. I mm -hmm. think that's really what we should be hoping for as, a, uh, as an organization. I, don't, I cannot speak for, obviously for all of them, for all organizations, but I think for ours in particular, that's important, that, that people start wondering, you know, is these Facebook posts that I see real or what is the data that backs that up? <laughs> yeah, because it's a really hard thing when you theory of change and you ask people, so you can give me your outputs, but what is the outcome that you seek? And I think that's a really hard one to articulate for a lot of organizations, you know, yeah. and. And it makes it harder to think about what should you be measuring? What should you be capturing, right? Right. And, and right. so here, I think for you guys, this paper and this thinking has allowed you to think, okay, what are we trying to actually do? Is what we're doing working, number one? And is right. what we're doing actually achieving the goals, right? That we right. seek, the change that we seek in people. And that's a hard one to measure, which is a long-term kind of thing, right? You want them to be like how, it's just hard to, 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 to measure and, and track it down to you, right? That, that, right, that's you know. the issue, right? Like how do we track yeah. it down to this one week thing? Yeah, um, yeah. Which, you know, we got, a, you know, 
we have a lot of anecdotal testimonies from the students who have been yeah. in the program five years ago saying, you know, this really changed my life. Thanks to this, I would have never gone to a master otherwise. Like, I wouldn't have even thought about it. Right. right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, but that's anecdotal data, right? Like, it's not numbers uh, at the end of the day. So, <laughs> yeah. I think it's actually a challenge of us as a field to try to determine really what are the right statistics to measure. Athletes. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's something that we, we try to do in the SAI uh, seminars. To try to get at this because it's a, it's a struggle a lot of organization founders are trying to figure that out and, and so what, what would be your advice as someone who's people who are doing outreach initiatives out there organizations in terms of metrics and thinking about change from what you've seen and you guys are growing really rapidly um, as you're interacting with governments and so forth what advice do you give people especially in thinking about change measuring change um, yes yeah, so it's for us the you know, one of the bigger metrics, which this and actually go to the paper, mm -hmm. is like, A, how likely are the kids to come, like to reapply or to volunteer for the organization, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or to like be part of this community, right? Because again, at the end of the day, we are an education institution that wants not only to transmit data, but transmit concepts. And if, if we show the data and the data is just, you know, you gain knowledge, like any course will gain, give you knowledge, uh, are we actually doing anything different from the universities, you know? Uh, uh, and is it, is it having a need for us in, in these programs, uh, in these programs? So I think for us, it has been that, uh, now I don't know how to numerically say that, but you know, we have some data of like, you know, how many people this, this particular student bring to this organization, meaning, you know, prefer yeah. us. Yeah. Um, I think that's also an interesting measurement. We haven't looked at this data in quite detail. We have the data there. Uh, and I think it will be a very interesting idea of how this is influencing this building of community. Because at the end of the day, a country is a community, right? And, and we really yeah. want to the community. Right, right. Um, I know Juliet had to run um, soon, but thank you so much for joining us, Juliet. Uh, but I think, yeah, this is, uh, I think we just touched the surface here, actually, on this conversation and there's many more uh, to have and thinking about outreach and really the other thing also connecting organizations who are doing um, similar things. Uh, for example, as I told you, Science Core, I think is a really great organization that they're also just trying to grapple with this in terms of what exactly are we doing, how are we doing impact and because these funders ultimately, they want to see what change you know they want to see change they want to see impact and and a lot right. of funding is attached to it and the funding too right like what, what, yeah. what, how else do we like get a new grant if we don't show yeah. the data right like we couldn't have been gone in this grant from the Bolivian government which again is pretty pretty substantial right uh, without the uh without this data right, right. And that, right. that was kind of the, the cover letter of it of the paper, right? <laughs> yeah, and then, and then you have now this to, to then build on this, right? To, to showcase right. other places, get more funding, and collaborate with other organizations. So I'll tell you that we are very interested in thinking about this too, and collaborating with you guys maybe at some point at the SAI level. Absolutely. Of course, Absolutely. Uh, even I put on my Harvard hat too. Uh, we are already collaborating on this front, so. Uh. <laughs> uh, I don't think we will have Clubes without Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's great. But uh, so at that point, uh, we are done uh, two oh eight p.m. And so uh, Mo, again, thank you so much, Leo. Uh, you are online too. Uh, not that I forgot about you. You are there. Thank you. Again. I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to, to both of you for doing all the hard work and getting this off. Uh -huh. And I'm excited to see where this goes and new places that it could be. I really want to see a Club de Ciencia somewhere in Africa. Really, guys. And let's let's, yeah. let's let's work on that. We were That's considering it happen. Actually, <laughs> it was again Ghana initial F, but then it kind of got dropped. I, I was in Thailand last year. We we're trying to set something up in okay. Thailand. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Africa, I think, should be definitely our next yeah, and especially that mode. If you can really, if you have like even a, a instruction manual, a checklist, right? Uh, the, the curriculum, in a way, right? That you can say, if you want to start this, this is a thing that we do because it's a one week uh, portal that I'm still, I'm still trying to get my head around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we long -term have it in the paper. We have every single yeah. reagent that we use, uh, which where we actually got it from, meaning like who donated it. Yeah, but most I'm thinking, yeah, those, yeah, I'm thinking more just the structure of, yeah. okay, this is articulate what the problem because ultimately this whatever area you go to is, is going to have to address whatever the local issue is right? right you can't you can't just come in and say i want to do what you know you're working in bolivia i'm going to replicate the same thing over here 
it might not right. work, right? Those graphs could right. be flat, right? right? So, so the ultimately is what kind of questions should someone be thinking about in launching a program like this, you know, thinking back to those early elements, okay, you should be asking the following questions, A, B, C, then, you know, in, you know anyway. Sorry, I said, something that we do mm -hmm. quite a bit is like in the application process itself, we ask mm -hmm. one question to the students, which is, if you were to design a top a, a, a course, what would the topic be? And that actually helps us rethink what courses we want to teach the next year. So the very first year was just, you know, we, we kind of winged with whatever we had available, meaning whoever was able to teach that year. Uh, we only had three courses the very first year. But the second year, we actually knew exactly what we we're looking for because the students told us what they wanted. Uh, Yes, so, yes, it's uh, enough to get that data right from the, from the users almost, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, I mean, this is something that completely shifted to us quite a, you know, like, because originally, uh -oh. I think we lost Mo. <laughs> hmm. Okay, let's see if he's gonna come back. Right. Thank you. Oh, and you came back. I think his battery probably died. <laughs> oh, maybe. Yeah, it's possible. Let me uh, stop this video. Oops. Yeah.